This is a public meeting of the Indiana Arts Commission. Today we are reviewing Lifelong Arts Indiana 2021 Fellowship Proposals. I am Chris Roberts, Operations Manager for the Columbus Area Arts Council in Columbus, Indiana. Today is Tuesday, December 21st, 2021, and it is 10 a.m. Eastern Time. The panelists are meeting on Zoom and the public is observing on YouTube. At this time, we would like the panelists and staff to introduce themselves stating their names, occupations, and where they're currently located. We will start with John. I'm John Kay. I'm the Director of Traditional Arts Indiana, a statewide folk arts program that's based at Indiana University, where I'm actually uh, sitting right now. Thanks, John. Ploy? I am Ploy Pagdalian, Senior Director of Programs for Arts for Learning Indiana. Our office is in Marion County, Indianapolis, but I'm calling from my home in Zionsville. Thanks, Boy. And Rachel. I am Rachel Witt. I'm the art programming coordinator and art instructor at Westminster Village, a long-term care facility in West Lafayette. And I am in my home, hoping my dogs behave. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie Haynes, uh, Arts Education and Accessibility Program Manager and the Lifelong Arts Program Manager. And Chapin. Hey there, I'm Chapin Schnick. I'm the Grants Research and Technology Manager at the Indiana Arts Commission, and I'm here on the state campus and acting in a technology role today. Thank you all. This panel is designed to gather feedback that will help the applicants strengthen their creative aging residency projects. The discussion will also help IAC staff identify any important modifications applicants may be required to make to their fellowship projects before moving forward. I will announce the applications we will review. I'll ask the first reader to begin the discussion. The first reader will provide advice to strengthen the fellowship project, focusing on the evaluation criteria from their perspective. Panelists, please note that the applications do not need to be recapped since everyone has read them. Just provide your comments. After the first reader has finished, I will open discussion for any additional comments from other panelists. Remember, in the interest of time, we are only looking for new, additional, or differing viewpoints. If a panelist has a conflict of interest, that panelist will be placed in the virtual waiting room while the application is discussed. Finally, once the application has been discussed by the full panel, we will ask the panel to update their comments in the online system. It is common for recommendations to change as a re result of this broader discussion. The changes will save automatically. Are there any questions? Okay, then let's begin. We will start with the application, Angie Andrio, and the first reader is John. Um, yes, uh, this was a, a very interesting application. Uh, it was uh, painting uh, self-portraits, playing on the concept of senior portraits, uh, go, harkening back to high school days. And it was um, basically five two-hour sessions sometime in March and April. It seemed like there was a lot of this that was still kind of left up in the air. There's supposedly a meeting that's going to happen uh, soon after the first of the year that's going to be the flesh out some aspects of this and so I, that caused a little bit of concern that uh, uh, maybe maybe it's not quite solidified yet but it's far enough in the future that that doesn't seem uh, like a, a big deal but I did have two things that I, I wanted to, to broach uh, about this application uh, one was a uh, artist uh, is basically contributing $404 of, of her money towards this project. It seems like that the artist is, she realizes that she's spending more than actually that there's funds. Uh, and it seemed a little bit, I was just a little unsure about that. I always have concerns when people start dipping into their pockets this early on in a project that uh, ultimately they're, they're creating something that's not very sustainable. And ultimately, I mean, that's what we're really hoping for, for a lot of this work is that we're going to make the artist sustainable. We're going to make the art situation sustainable. And so uh, I would love to see maybe that some sharing of those expenses, because that seemed like a big, big part. There was also there was a mention that the church was probably going to contribute towards the reception, but that was un, 
uh, unsolidified. I have a feeling that probably will happen, but I would I just wanted to flag uh, those things. So that was the first thing in the budget that I saw that I was wanted to earmark. As far as expenses go, it seemed very, very realistic to me. I'm not a painter, so I don't necessarily know, so I'll defer to my colleagues on the panel here uh, about those things. Uh, but the bigger issue I had was as, as cute as the topic is, the idea of senior portraits is, um, I just worry that that might not be a very popular or very it may be opening up things for older adults that maybe we they don't want to deal with head on. Uh, the idea of same this idea of youth culture and then the wisdom years. Uh, Senior is still a very problematic term for older adults. Uh, many uh, it's not something that many identify with uh, readily, or it causes maybe if they do, it causes them hard feelings. Uh, and the second part of that is. When people get older, I know this, I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror and say, who, who is that looking back at me? And I know there's a certain degree of combating ageism uh, and self-ageism uh, self um, in this assignment or this um, the series. Uh, but I wonder if it's the right first introduction to this, uh, that maybe it's after you've built a cohort that you're actually going to do this. Maybe it's painting a favorite family member or something like that. So just the idea that maybe people aren't quite as comfortable with uh, their receding hairline and their gray hair and their wrinkles. Uh, and I understand wanting to, to bring that um, to the fore uh, is important. One, uh, one more, the social engagement aspect uh, of this uh, seemed very underdeveloped. And I would really like to see maybe some writing prompts or, or some t talking prompts, not just compliment each other. It's just like the same one repeated over and over. I think having a concrete way of like, okay, you do that at the beginning of the class maybe is a good thing or at the end of the class, but maybe you have something you're framing around people talking about or something you bring in to focus people uh, so that the social engagement happens. Because this is something that someone can get very focused in on their thing and not necessarily, even though they're co-present with each other, they're not necessarily there. Um, so that was, that was, those were some of my things. It, it seems like a, uh, a great project. I really loved uh, the partnership with the church. It seemed like a really good, strong partnership. I think just a little tweaking of, uh, of the subject matter uh, might be appropriate. And maybe, maybe Rachel, uh, I think you might have a better idea about some of this uh, than I do. So I agree with much of what you've said there, John. And we actually did a portrait, a self-portrait project in the studios with the teaching artist. And where our normal class size, you hit the nail on the head when you said a, a lack of desire to even register for that. Um, and because that's where people will get stopped. So we typically will have 12 to 15 participants in a class for that particular class. We had eight come the first time and only six continue on. And the, the, what they were doing was actually a collage project. So it was even less life realistic. And we tried to even soften it that way. We advertised it as a portrait at any age. So the person could bring any photo of themselves at any age that they wanted to reflect upon. All of them chose to do self-portraits at that time, we took the pictures live and they made exceptional work. It, every one of them was exceptional and really represented how they saw themselves. Uh, one gentleman who was 92 did a self-portrait of himself as a superhero. So it was outstanding. But again, it's that lack of willingness to even step into portraiture and self-portrait that's difficult. And so well, I love the idea and I've seen it play out in beautiful ways, my strong suggestion would be to adjust, soften the medium a little bit so that there's more than perhaps just acrylic and brush and soften the technique a little bit. Uh, even perhaps if they make the background the wild portion of this, they can put themselves in any setting, that might be a way to soften it. Um, but additionally, just consider how you can take it off of the, the photo at that moment and how they look. Because John's right, folks are gonna struggle a little bit with, I don't like how I look right now. And while we'd love to move them on, I'm not sure that's done in one hit, you know, 
I see them as beautiful. They may not be in that same place. <laughs> so I, otherwise in terms of materials, just as John said, I think it's very appropriate. I think the timing is very appropriate. I think your specific lesson plan is very appropriate. Um, yes, uh, the more specifics on the ramp up with um, the social prompts. So those are my two cents, maybe five cents. I would like to offer another option with regards to not being comfortable with the current state of aging. <laughs> In addition to what you said, Rachel, that maybe bring a photo of, of um, from their youth or from a stage in their life that they, they prefer. What if also we the prompt would be to take a photo of your favorite part of your face or self at this moment? Because there, there might be some adults that are quite comfortable of where they're at. And that's at least an option. And what I see with that particular exercise of taking photos of each other is that there is a good social interaction there. It gets, you know, you have a space to get to know each, um, each other in that regard. And I'm gonna shift then that if this was in Zoom, I recommend to still do that exercise of taking pictures of each other by placing the pairs in a breakout room. Because I think then you could really get into knowing each other better in that way. In, in a very, I would say in a very interactive way, taking pictures. And obviously I assume that this is set up in a way that, that the pairs are, are familiar with each other and it's not an awkward state where you're in a room with a stranger taking pictures of each other. So um, there is some social element and um, social interaction about that. But yeah, to take that comfort level, that's a, it's a good point that I didn't see in the beginning, which is very well presented here. I just have a couple more of additional comments, which um, um, lends to the strength of this proposal. I think that um, the tracing strategy that they say in the second lesson is a wonderful access point for people who are not comfortable with drawing or not familiar with it. And to just be able to trace a picture and transfer that uh, it's really setting up the participants for success. My biggest recommendation if they do take photos is that provide an assistant just in case you have older adults that struggle with technology, iPhone, Android, whatever the devices used here. I think assistance will be helpful there again to set up the whole experience for success. That's a great point. Uh, boy, I, in that situation, spent a lot of time running back and forth the copy machine to get them a large enough photo and you know you just you do need another pair of legs for that piece of it mm -hmm. the other thing i want to i love the idea of a portion of themselves um i also would say i had one two women who participated in this class one of the women happened to be in the background of the photo that was taken and the woman who did the portrait included the other person in the background and it was this great bonding moment between them. And so those possibilities do exist for great social interaction in this type of project. Okay, thank you all. Um, please finalize your comments in the online system. And if you could give me a thumbs up when you're done so that I know we're ready to move on. Are you ready, John? Yes. Okay, great. Then we will move on to our next applicant, John Kirsten Batson, and first reader is Ploy. Okay. Um, let's see here. So a few comments. Um, this is the steel drums experience and off the bat, I was just really amazed of how unique this could be for older adults. It's not every day that we hear steel drum music. And so I think this is a novel idea to bring to that 
particular group. And also there's an addition of poetry later in the lesson. And that just adds another layer, another dimension to the experience, a combination of music and words. Um, I thought the artist prompt questions were very engaging. Uh, that just, you know, it just goes beyond the experience, but even delves deeper into who they are, what kind of music they like. And um, lastly, uh, the, the sense of creating a group song is, is just lends itself to community ship, you know, forming a group and getting to know each other better. Um, the, the fact that the artist thought about storage and transporting equipment is really great. And um, hauling large and huge amount of equipment is not easy as we know, which leads me to my feedback that perhaps they should consider it's not higher artist fee for all that work, but a cartage fee for the effort that they put into, I mean, moving large instruments to the truck from the truck to the site and then moving it from storage to the workroom for what, this is a six session, yeah, six times throughout the whole experience. So um, to accommodate that, maybe they should consider reducing this to five sessions so that they could have more room, uh, more funds actually to pay themselves for all that effort of, of hauling things. Another comment I have is that there's a couple of reference to showing videos in the lesson plan, and that is early on in the experience. I believe they start with a video and then go on with the experience. Videos is a wonderful way of extending the lesson, but I would um, encourage the artist to consider making that interactive or maybe even put it towards the end rather than have a passive experience in the beginning. Why not start with something active, playing with the drums, interacting with the music or, or mingling with each other rather than this passive experience of watching a video. Just a thought there. Um, uh, as I said, videos are great, but maybe put it to in the middle or towards the end of, of every lesson. And um, really that's my biggest comment, that cartage fee, because I know it's not easy to haul equipment here and there. And uh, they wanna do six sessions, which I think could really be a burden to the artist. Boy, when I read it, I thought, I read it that the facility they were using was going to keep it safe. Uh, and, and secure. So they were just going to be transporting it there, leaving it for the six weeks and then transferring it back out again. I read that differently. I don't know if that's accurate or not. Oh, well, I understood it correctly too, Rachel, that way, okay. but just the fact that they are hauling right. instruments from home to location and then from the storage to the classroom. Okay. I mean, that's worth acknowledging that that's a lot of work on the artist's part. Agreed. That is a lot of work and, and risk. Anytime you move an instrument, there's risk embedded in moving it. Mm -hmm. So um, my only, I think it's, an, I agree with everything you've said there. And my only um, additional comment is uh, based on the size of the room noted and kind of the variety of um, program, I would suggest adding some kind of tangible belonging to the group. Something as simple as a name tag that helps everyone in the room know your name and be able to dress you by first name is important. Um, and that's everybody in the room, not just the older artists who are participating. Um, and another thought, maybe a tangible, at some variety of tangible memory from that. If it's a photo, uh, if it's a certificate of completion, if it's the music that they wrote, you know, that the artist autograph, whatever it is, but something tangible they can take with them that helps trigger a memory, trigger a positive reminisce can be shared with their family or their friends as something they've accomplished. Um, I know, that, you know, we don't necessarily want to promote more stuff, but when you talk about music and experiences in particular, I think, I think it's really important to focus upon a sense of belonging and also a sense of, of memory and things that can spark kind of residual joy from an experience that's been had. Uh, I agree with everything you all are was saying about the um, cartage fee. I think uh, the idea of making it a little more durable that lasts. I, I was going in a little bit different direction. This seems like something that could easily end up generating a group on the on the other end of it. It seems to me like the idea of if you go through this this thing, it's kind of an entree maybe into a much larger musical world for for this group. And so maybe the 
the persistent memory thing is actually okay now every uh, every week we're going to get together or twice a month we're going to get together and there might be some residual uh, thing like that I've seen that happen over and over again where we do a short music workshop and then there's a a club or whatever so I would very much love to see that there's some type of way that these older adults could be able to take ownership of it and maybe continue after this um, uh, after this period of time uh, coming back to the thing that Ploy mentioned was um, uh, the video uh, I wouldn't shy away from making uh, having this as like homework type of things of like sharing with them uh, via YouTube or whatever what they would be able to uh, what they should do beforehand and then maybe do a buddy system around that that they actually do what uh, watching uh, watching club or whatever together uh, in that uh, on a very positive note uh, uh, Stephanie can tell you I'm, I'm very uh, critical of, uh, of the social engagement aspect of many of the, of the things. I don't think there's been enough thought into that. I really thought that the social engagement parts during the sessions were really well uh, developed on this one and I was really excited about, uh, about that. All right, thank you all. If you could finalize your comments and give me a thumbs up when you are ready to move on. Okay, our next applicant is Leota M. Bauman, and Rachel, you are first reader. Um, I think it's an excellent concept, an excellent lesson outline. Uh, I was very grateful to see you note um, a deliberate shift from um, production to experiential art making. Um, and I think you built some very robust socialization prompts. Uh, I also think that um, strengths of this are the partnership with the long-term care facility and also the art barn uh, as an outside facility. Um, I don't have any concerns with the feasibility. I think it's excellent. Um, I, in general, don't have a lot to add to this. The only um, kind of negative for what it's worth is that you may have some participants, particularly because you're coming from long-term care facility, who have some physical limitations that you need to work around. Um, for example, just consider what options you have when you're dealing with visual barriers, which are very common. Um, uh, so that's often adjusting the angle to the artist. Uh, some are gonna see better flat on the table. Some need a pool noodle on the table. Some need a full easel. Um, what are you gonna have on hand to modify the brush grips? Will you have long and short handle brushes available? Uh, can you do a blue tape on hand that you can modify the grip on a brush? Um, those types of things, uh, as you're working with uh, older artists, it's important to have thought through, I believe it's important to have thought through what accommodations you can make quickly and in the moment, because those best respect the dignity of the person making art. Uh, and it, it helps avoid a scenario where they feel like they can't do it so they should quit. You always have to stop short of the quit line. And so being able to say, oh, I have just the solution for that, or oh, let's get you another light, or how about a cushion for that chair? Those types of plan aheads, if you don't use them, great, but if you do use them, they make a world of difference. So I would really encourage you to think through, obviously, I don't know what the art barn looks like and what the facility is available, but think through options, accommodations, and flexibility to take away as many of those barriers as you possibly can. My observations were exactly the same uh, about that. Just really worrying about the adaptability, how you might be able to make it more inclusive. Um, and I'm sure they probably have ideas for that and they didn't get fleshed out in, in okay. that, but just, just kind of signaling to us that you've put some thought into the adaptability uh, of that type of work because I, th I think that that's uh, very true. I also think that this uh, this seems like uh, not an end 
end program, but actually the beginning of something, maybe an ongoing relationship, which I think is really uh, what this program is intended to foster. And I'd like to add on the adaptability issue that if they are planning on observational drawing since they're in a farm and they're going outside and being one with nature, that doubles the challenge, isn't it? Because then we're taking um, mobility and, and whatnot, being out in the elements with animals and whatnot. With um, tender adults, uh, something to be considered if that is the case. But what a gift to be there in that um, location. I would like to add that, um, hold on here, give me a second. I do have a question about the budget. There is an, a line item there for $200 for ad, um, admin for registration. Not quite sure what that is, only because um, there's also a mention of ready volunteers to help. So I wasn't quite sure um, what those two are and if, if the volunteers could take care of the registration as well. So that's my only question there. And um, maybe that is required by the partner site. There's something that probably needed to be said. And also, um, because this is a sign-up program, it's not like we have a dedicated group already from a facility that's interested in this. I believe there is a, an interest in opening it up for people to sign up. For, maybe a backup plan, just in case there's low interest. What, what can we do to get people there? Because it's a wonderful experience if we get participants there. So just a little more thought into recruitment, perhaps. Okay, thank you all. If you could finalize comments and give me a thumbs up when you're ready. Okay, our next applicant is Michael Ann Carley, and John, you are first reader. Uh, yes, this is, um, uh, to remind you all, it's a drawing class kind of at the intersection of, of self and nature, uh, simplified shapes, uh, and then trying to find these, the kind of symbolic pieces and, and to move it on into creating abstract pieces, uh, and, uh, time, and also bringing in uh, time for personal uh, reflection uh, in this and these development of personal um, 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 personal symbols. Um, there were just uh, there are going to be six uh, ninety-minute sessions. I didn't understand, and it was hard for me to really get the instruction uh, from the general narrative. It seemed like in the lesson plans it was much more spelled out, so that was helpful to me as someone who's not a, a, a drawer. Uh, so that was helpful. Um, it seemed to me that I had a question about the final culminating event. Uh, it, it was like it's going to be on YouTube, it's going to be uh, a public presentation, but it seemed like maybe it was only going to be online. Is it going to be uh, at a group? I'd like to have that uh, more uh, more developed. Uh, I also think that this is another one where the, the social engagement prompts really needed a, a little more thought. Uh, how is this really different from just a regular art class? Uh, it seemed to be be a really great class, I, uh, uh, but it didn't necessarily have the prompts to uh, bring it towards uh, creative aging. And I'd like to see that, a little more thought put into that. So just from a, an art making standpoint, um, it seems to me actually with the lesson plan to flow quite well, uh, moving on through gesture and that type of thing. Um, I understand the desire to just stick to graphite pencil. Uh, I will tell you that uh, you're handing um, persons a lot of little pieces uh, of things. And uh, so some method of containment device is just a small practical matter that'll make um, and that didn't seem to be included anywhere in the purchases. Uh, and even if it's a Ziploc bag, for goodness sakes, it's a detail that'll make a big difference. In addition, there was no mention of any uh, method to sharpen the pencils in the purchase. And so that is something that is very relevant to this particular type of class. Um, on a little bit more to speak to a little bit more to what John mentioned, my um, 
my concern was that this proposal wrote was written as though it was really uh, hosting it at the artist's own facility to people they've already encountered. Uh, there was no um, significant community engagement that I noted. And I, I'm not sure that feels entirely in line with the purpose of the fellowship to me. So while I think it sounds like a very good art class, um, I would like to see this proposal modified to approach local long-term care facilities or other senior programs, uh, area on aging, and try and draw in some individuals who are beyond that 55 age, uh, who maybe have fewer opportunities to engage in the benefits of art making. So this just seemed kind of targeted at that market comfortable zone. And based on what's written here, I feel like the, the teaching artist has the potential to really expand what they're doing to a much greater benefit to this target market than they have written here in the proposal. And maybe that's their intent, but I just didn't read it in the proposal. So. First off, um, the most detailed budget among the applications I've read and kudos <laughs> to the artists for doing that. <laughs> Truly appreciate it. And because it's readily understandable, right? And so, um, one thing though, I think seven sessions is a little bit too much from the amount of money that they are working with. I just want to caution either maybe scale back so that there is that the room. We want to value the artist time, but a lot of it, um, seven sessions for a thousand dollars that they're working with um, might be a little bit too much um, in my opinion. And also look at the end date. Um, if my understanding is correct, this is three days before the final, before the end date of the lifelong program itself. That's a little too close for comfort just in case something happens, which we know they will, um, that you have a buffer there and you're not like scrambling to complete the, the, the project um, close so close to the deadline. Lastly, um, Large paper, in addition to Rachel's idea of, of better writing tools, uh, large paper invites, well, it's a gestural drawing. So I'm expecting movement, large movements and, and uh, large movements and markings on the paper could be easier for others who do not have fine control movement. So maybe in addition to, to a more appropriate writing tool, what about large paper too? So that those who are able can actually really just move and, and go at it. I believe that's the last one. I agree with securing a commitment with a partner organization. Oh, this one. Um, there is a mention of PowerPoint presentations as examples. Uh, what about tactile examples too, so that the participants can handle it and have a better connection to, to those? Makes it multi-sensory for them. Those are great points. And I wanna add that the just even large pads of newsprint are incredibly successful. Um, in terms when it, uh, and approachable for participants um, because they don't feel wasteful. If it's, you know, just keep drawing. It's not wasteful. Throw that one away. Let's make another one. <laughs> Have a big old recycle bin there. Just some small things um, can help um, remove failure uh, from this scenario. Okay, thank you all. If you can finalize comments, give me a thumbs up. Okay, our next applicant is Karen Schillman. Rachel will be first reader and we have a conflict of interest from Ploy, so she will be going into the waiting room. Um, I really enjoyed the focus on building skills week after week, as well as the introduction um, from the supply list uh, of various drawing mediums. Um, the exhibit connection to a community event is also excellent. Um, and opportunities for self-selection of artwork that are noted are really important. 
it is a wonderful idea to extend a couple of weeks to allow work time for persons who work a little bit slower or just want some more time uh, in their process. Um, I think it's very important for this proposal for the teaching artist to consider what the response and adjustment will be if participants drop off of the program uh, partway through. That is likely to happen. Um, for any number of reasons, um, health, weather, scheduling conflict, general feelings of discouragement. Um, and uh, again, I have to comment uh, and ask you, the artist, to consider how instructionally you're going to deal with some kind of common physical limitations participants may have, um, a variety of samples. Um, for example, if you're dealing with drawing, uh, showing a sample that has a lot of vibration to the line that is a mimic of a hand tremor is automatically more welcoming um, to someone who has a hand tremor and is worried about drawing. Um, you also may find that some participants struggle uh, with processing symmetry correctly um, and, and or have gaps in their vision. So when you're talking about still life, offering high contrast objects, turntables, spotlighting, and also visual framing can really help a teaching art or teach, uh, help an older artist to be successful to kind of get over some barriers. And then finally, I would ask the teaching artist to consider um, the, some endurance issues of drawing for 90 minutes. That's a lot. Um, and so often lap boards, foam, support, foam support, small cushions, a, a couple of good pool noodles will take you a miles in this type of thing <laughs> in terms of offering some accommodation um, and help adjust the participant's physical position for less wear and tear and more sense of success. Um, if you think about working with, a, um, working with an older artist, if this is not something they've spent their life doing uh, and they do have some physical limitations, they encounter that in everything they do from getting out of bed to brushing their teeth, to eating a meal, to just walking down the hall. So if art can help relieve some of those physical limitations and make it approachable, it's much, much more likely to feel positive and joyful to the participant. So I would just encourage you to flesh those ideas out a little bit more in this uh, proposal. Uh, I, I agree with all of those uh, those comments. Um, on a positive note, I, I really like that you're meeting with the uh, Historical Society and the Senior Center. That seemed like great local partners. Seems like you're really going to be able to kind of build a relationship uh, with these groups, um, uh, or, or at least augment a relationship maybe that already exists. Um, and they're going to work really well to help get the word out. Um, I think that uh, I'd like to know more about the the gallery showing what that uh, what that's going to look like and the reception. You know, there could be uh, it, it could be really engagement and think about family coming in or community coming in, that type of thing. I'd like to know more about that that culminating event. Keeping on that idea of social engagement, as I've said, my my I harp on the, the social engagement part of it. I'm a folklorist, um, and uh, the, the icebreakers didn't necessarily seem all that relevant. Uh, I, I would like to maybe spend some more time thinking about what those icebreakers or those social engagement prompts uh, are are going to be uh, to get people talking. And and as you're doing these still life. I wonder if there's ways of having people pick objects that are specifically meaningful to them that kind of seemed like you were hinting at that, but I'd really love to, to think about like personal objects and drawing these things and the, uh, the idea of social engagement around those might be, uh, uh, might be kind of powerful. So you're not just drawing a flower, but you're actually drawing uh, you know, your grandmother's uh, piney, piney flowers, uh, you know, that type of thing. Um, so those were just some of mine. Uh, uh, my thing, basically, the the prompts though was the the biggest thing I wanted to, to highlight. Okay, thank you both. If you could finalize comments and let me know when you're finished, then we can invite Ploy back into the discussion. Okay, Chapin, we can let Ploy back in. Oh, 
Welcome back, Ploy. Our next applicant is Emily Borrero. And Ploy, you are our first reader. Mm -hmm. So um, just a reminder, this is the flower making with tissue paper. And um, this is, uh, it looks like the, the site is located in between or nearby two facilities that that serve um, older adults, which I think is an asset because then you have quite a um, good grab or, or a good amount of people that you can attract to it. So the strength of the program, in my opinion, is that it's a very tactile experience. You're working with tissue paper and, and pipe cleaners and all that. And that can be a wonderful experience. And as I said earlier, the location of the studio too, I think is an asset because it's nearby assisted living facilities. Um, five sessions is my um, my cutoff for the amount of money that we're working with here. So she's on track for that one. And um, I, I would recommend though considering um, hand mobility issues um, by adding either session, but not going beyond five, because I do want to honor the time of the artist for that. Um, just to give people more time to work with um, the material and to work on their flowers and on their final display. And the reason being is that I'm curious as to how the use of tacky glue and tissue paper would go with adults with mobility issues. Um, that can get very <laughs> nasty fast. I mean, I struggle with it myself. So um, I wonder if there's another type of glue that will work better in this uh, situation. And also folding. Um, when I was thinking about my comments, like creasing um, kind of requires some strength too to have that really good fold. But since we're working with tissue paper, that may not be a problem, but then tearing then could potentially become a problem because you, one may not have good control of their fine motor skills as they're handling the very um, soft materials. So those are my, my major comments and recommendations. So from an art making standpoint, I'm fairly certain that the tacky glue is intended for the women of the world felt flowers that are part of the kits. I think that that kit requires uh, the, the glue and it would be the appropriate kind of glue for that. And that the tissue uh, is the folded tissue flower. And particularly for this, I love the idea of, a, of the theme of it. I loved flowers as a cultural, as a storytelling mode. And, uh, it, everyone can re relate to flowers in some form or fashion. Um, I felt like this process uh, could be strengthened with some additional reference to art making processes in general. Um, many uh, older artists may experience this as childish. Many of them generationally made paper flowers in the first and second grade. And when you are in that situation, A, it takes you back to the first grade, which maybe that's okay. But if you encounter difficulty, then doing that thing that you knew you could do when you were six years old, you are essentially shaming. It's a shaming situation for that artist and it's discouraging. And so I would encourage, I'm okay with the four art making sessions. I think four art making sessions is a little slim actually. I think I'm a little bit opposite of you on that, but. Um, I, I would like to see opportunities to increase, to, to add some art making to this, whether that is painting the tissue that is to be used, whether that is to cut, collage, monoprint, incorporate fresh, fresh flowers. Uh, I also think I'm going to steal this from you, John, and say that the socialization prompts seem a little soft to me. Uh, and I would like to see those be stronger if specifically you're, you're trying to uh, understand culturally the role flowers have played for individuals. Some open-ended reminiscing prompts could be very well-timed and placed in this program. Everyone has had some encounter with flowers in their lives. They carry them in their wedding or they have a least favorite one or a most favorite one and, and flowers smell good and smell triggers memory. And so um, there, there's just, this is so wide open. And while I like a lot about the, the proposal, I feel like it stops really short conceptually of what could be done with this particular format while respecting the teaching artist's time and investment in it. So um, those are 
those are my thoughts. Sorry to steal your thunder, John. I know it's probably coming. <laughs> Sorry, I have problems unmuting here. Um, yeah, uh, I agree with uh, everything you all have said. It did seem, from the, the kind of non-visual artist person here, it kind of seemed like the art part of it was a little uh, underdeveloped um, in this. Uh, as a folklorist, I've done work with lots of uh, older artists who make corn shuck flowers and crepe paper flowers and, uh, and do a whole variety of forms and, 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 and pieces. Uh, so I, I was kind of intrigued by, uh, by this, the idea that it could be something that's not just teaching static forms, but actually a whole repertoire of flowers and, and being uh, very purposeful about this. Uh, the service region is right right at the heart of uh, the Miami people. Uh, you could be talking about the, the Great Lakes um, uh, flower uh, traditions of beadwork and, and that sort of thing could be brought into this. All, all the floral uh, quilts and, and things like that of that of, of that region too, among the Amish and the Mennonite, uh, it could be something that's brought into, um, into it. So it seemed like thinking about the cultural side of this didn't get didn't get deep beyond the, the kind of surface level. So I really would encourage thinking about what are the experiences of these people and how are they going to be able to communicate those through the flowers that they're creating and maybe what very, very particular flowers are you going to be able to make that are kind of meaningful uh, culturally, individually, personally uh, in this process. So I think just a little bit, uh, a little bit more um, uh, about this, I'm not going to harp on the on the socialization prompts because Rachel's already done it for me. Uh, but but really think about why are we why flowers? You know, it, I I I could sit here and I could I could go through flowers and I could instantly if you held up a flower I could probably tell you a memory. Uh, and I think you should create opportunities for that with these older adults and the fact that it becomes about making the art, but then about something much more, about them having command over their stories. So uh, think about think about this as uh, uh, how it's not going to be that first grade uh, thing because I can't move my hands, but actually how I can be the master of the stories that I'm telling through this process. I want to expand on that, John, that perhaps the first session, bring your favorite flower. So then you already have ownership with the experience by bringing your favorite flower. And yes, please display actual flower in the room, because since we're making flowers, but in addition to the engagement um, situation, what about arranging the room in a circular um, format so that they can see each other's progress as they move along? And that also really invites easy conversation when you see people face to face rather than um, probably in small groups. Well, it depends. It depends on the nature of the group. Yeah, small groupings, large grouping, but that circular format um, just naturally invites you to converse as you're seeing each other progress. That's all. Okay, thank you all. If you can finalize comments, give me a thumbs up. We will move on. Our next applicant is Tamarin Jones Francis, and John, you are first reader. Uh, I should start off by saying I just loved this topic. This, this it just it, bringing uh, pottery and food together, and, and the socialization of bringing people together around this common meal it was just really a brilliant way of thinking about uh, about that. And I, I just kept thinking about these are going to be items that people are going to be able to used to engage with people from that moment on, not just a one-time uh, window. But I think there are uh, a few things. Um, uh, I love the fact that they're the five sessions to make all the different, uh, several different pieces, and the final class is uh, eating outside uh, with together. I was concerned about this, but it's two teaching artists, and luckily there's funds to bring in that extra person. I didn't see any possible way that one person could have done all of this work. It just seemed to be way um, too much. 
Um, but to me, this seemed like the social engagement is really kind of at the heart of this. Uh, but it's not really spelled out in the plans. I would love uh, for the prompts to be about like, you know, favorite food memories, fa common meals, the types of dishes and, and things that you ate off as a child or that you ate off with your children or, or whatever that it might be. That The fact that there's more of really kind of a celebration of of the, the social cohesion that happens around the table. And it seemed like the prompts could really bring uh, bring that into a much deeper way so they really feel like they're, they're building out the plate uh, type of thing. I think also um, what foods are going to be served at the, at the final meal is going to be really important. If you're going to be talking about different things, you know, for me, I, I, I would love persimmon pudding to be uh, uh, a part of it. You know, that's, that's my favorite family food. Uh, you know, if there was some way that people at least could bring in recipes or something like that to, to, to tie it in as well, even if you're not able to eat all of them at, at that moment. Uh, so those were just some of my thoughts about it. But I really just love the, the just general idea of this. But the social engagement prompts need to be much more focused and, and much more drawn out on this. I'd go to my art people here to talk about uh, materials and, and the like. And But just like you, John, I think I interpreted it that they were bringing their favorite food and I went back to the lesson plan for session five and it's actually a soup and bread event. So I, I assume this is provided, but yeah, that would be so much better if it's about your personal um, favorites. Um, if nothing else, bring your favorite recipe, right? So that you can share with the group. That's really great. I just want to commend uh, the thought of sending a ball of clay home for the participants to, to work with. I think that just um, not only makes it, um, extends the experience, but also um, reminds them of coming back to class and then looking forward to the next session and whatnot. And I think that's a, a very good touch. Obviously, the assumption is that they've been told how to take care of the clay while at home because otherwise they'll dry up if we don't take care of them. Um, accommodations for um, there again, hand mobility issues, if any, you know, what's um, to be just thinking ahead of that, which I'm, I'm assure, I assume that they are. And this is where the, the second artist really comes to play, I think, because I agree this is a very demanding program uh, physically for the participants. So assistance is important. I do like the progression of the lessons from basic hand building to then decorating their finished work. And it seems like there's a lot of, there's five sessions here for two artists to work with, which is good. And um, another advantage to this proposal is that they have an enthusiastic partner, quote unquote. So I like that. And that they are um, part of this co-creation, co-collaboration planning. Um, John, it's like you read my, what I typed about the um, prompts, because I think it is, food is so, so much attached to memory. Um, I love this. I teach ceramics weekly, <laughs> often. Um, I actually think that the level of teaching that you, they have is wonderful. Um, and they, I, I would anticipate, I, I noted that it was very important, actually, that they had the five weeks. Um, because not every person will make something functional every time. There'll be cracks, there'll be splits, there'll be things that happen. I would encourage them to, and they may do this just intrinsically, but I would encourage them to have um, some kind of functional blanks that they make uh, so that persons who maybe are struggling with the functional construction piece of it can still participate in the storytelling with the stamps. Uh, and still do that part of the decorative element of it if they're perhaps not having a lot of success with the building part of it. Um, starting with a bowl and a slump mold is fantastic. It's the best way to go in terms of um, probable success, in my opinion. Um, I would, as an adaptation, I would encourage you to really consider potential physical limitations. You may wanna consider tools with alternate grip techniques. Um, I kind of got the sense that you were talking about bisque stamps, if I had to guess. Uh, sometimes an addition of a cork or a spool handle can be helpful grip. Leather working tools with a tape wrap are excellent if for grip issues and strength issues. In addition, if, if you have individuals uh, who really are struggling with this, this stamp, there's a lot of 
um, issue with older adults who've not worked in ceramics before to understand the depth of what they're stamping. So some offside practice on a scrap piece of clay can result in a much better ability of freedom to story tell. Um, in addition, you may even want to get into wood or plaster uh, texture spheres. So those are bowls or balls uh, that can be used to roll across as part of a journeying or storytelling component. So think outside of the stamp and have options would be my advice. I also will say that older uh, artists tend to have much more fragile skin. And so it's very important to establish good self-care in terms of cleansing and moisturizing hands. I never let a resident leave without moisturizing their hands because finger splits are common. Um, and that's just a practical matter that you're gonna wanna be upfront about. Um, and even in that you have opportunities to enrich the experience. So selecting a fragrance lotion uh, it really helps uh, engender a sense of warmth and belonging and positive memory to the experience. Those little details make a world of difference and somebody feeling like they can really be successful in this environment. Um, but I love, love, love this presentation, this proposal. I'm so excited uh, to see it. And as John said, that community meal is fantastic. Can I add one more one more thing, just a kind of side observation about the storytelling portion of this is to also uh, try to show them maybe examples of other narrative objects. Sometimes, you know, things are, are prompts for the story. They don't have to visually tell the whole story. And sometimes people feel like they have to tell the whole story. And sometimes you just put in just a few elements and then they're called upon to be the narrators of this piece that they've created. Uh, and so less can sometimes be more uh, in that art making process. So sometimes getting them to think about, okay, what would you, what parts would you tell in words and what par parts will you tell visually here and, and think about that. I have one more to add. You just remind me, reminded me, John, that the title of the program is Storytelling Pottery for a Meal. Um, so the pottery obviously takes center stage in the experience and obviously the meal is culminating, but there's no session devoted to storytelling itself. But maybe that is explicit in the conversations while, while they're making things, but maybe just to be clear that that is also part of the experience and, and to thread that through so that they have a beginning, middle and end and whatever it is that they're they're sharing that that too culminates and they have developed something as they gather um, around a meal at the end. All right, thank you all. You can finalize your comments in the online system. And we're at an hour mark. So would anyone like to take a break for a couple of minutes? If you don't feel strongly, we can continue on through. Okay, last call for a break. All right, I'm not seeing anyone. So with that, we will move on. Our next applicant is Elizabeth Leachman and the first reader is Ploy. Too many screens open, I'm not sure. Here I am, okay. Um, this is the dance program um, that incorporates the title of it is, I'm having a hard time, let's see here, Discovering Movement for Older Adults, yes. So this is the dance program we're in. Um, they would provide um, that experience through structured dance classes, introducing the participants to a variety of dance styles. 
And uh, the, right off the bat, I think the strength is that they have a, already have a partnership with Robertson's senior apartments and utilizing their space eliminates the challenge of transportation. And though I'll balance that with also their thought of inviting another assisted facility, um, Rushton Apartments, which I think would think about transportation for that one too, just um, something to, to flag there. Uh, there is a mention in the lesson plan of a, a talk um, about the history of dance and movement and all that. Um, similar to the previous applicant about a PowerPoint presentation and showing a video in the beginning, which becomes a very passive experience. I would encourage you to perhaps incorporate the conversation or you know, the sharing of the history of dance while, while the group is already moving, which I think dance lends naturally for that kind of conversation. And this, um, it, it just makes, I think, the experience more whole rather than um, a lecture type experience. And um, I also recommend two sessions for choreography and rehearsal because you know, uh, things change and natural to dance, you rehearse, you revise, you rehearse, revise until you arrive at a final presentation. So I think having two sessions to practice is ideal without increasing the number of the total sessions because there again, we wanna respect the teaching artist time. Um, I wrote here, um, be intentional in the arrangement of and use of chairs and tables for support. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're thinking about that because it was said, I believe in this proposal that that is the case that they will be used for support, but to already be aware that you might need that for two participants in the back and then some over here to, to just put that front of mind because this is after all a movement activity and it's physical and not everybody will be able to stand and you might have to make adaptations for those who have to stay seated and only move from the, the top up and, and things like that. So um, movement is important for this population as we know, um, if they are able. Um, so I was really pleased to see this um, proposal as a response uh, to a request by residents for increased fitness opportunities. Um, I think that will help with engagement. It's not really clear to me from the proposal if this program is um, repeatable or sustainable uh, in any way. And um, I can't tell if it is um, really an opportunity to train volunteers or activities personnel or anyone in the method. So that's one piece. I'd like to see some component of sustainability. As much as I would love to be able to do something for five or six weeks and become fit, um, that is not the reality of it. And so I just think from a practical standpoint, um, that's important. Um, I also, um, I would, I'm not, I'm not sure that there's other, there are other people there in, an, in a support capacity. And so I'd like to see some attention given to what the um, safety of the participants would be. The reality is that movement comes with risks of falls and other injury. And I would like to know that um, there's some method or some mechanism in place so that if uh, somebody would have some variety of injury, they would have some support and the teaching artist would not be left trying to manage that by themselves. Um, that's not an ideal um, circumstance. Um, yes, I agree with the, all of those, um, all of those points. Uh, I think also, uh, the being sure that, um, that there's more social engagement, there's going to be down periods between dance and then that really trying to make sure that people, everyone is involved in that. It may happen organically, but sometimes having uh, some conversations about body movement and body motion in everyday life might be a, a prompt to talk about uh, or something like that. Um, but more talk about dance and movement. Uh, Personal experience with dance might be a, a good uh, conversational thing. Dance and combating ageism, you know, just all the stigma associated with that. Those might be things that you could do during the breaks of having group conversations around those um, uh, might be uh, might be effective and, and helpful. 
Um, I think that this, uh, like Rachel was saying, my main takeaway is this seems like the, it could support uh, like the music class we talked about earlier. This could be an ongoing group. I mean, you're you're creating. You know, you go in and you teach. It's great that you do that, but you know, what's the plan for it going forward? Is there, are you going to be able to uh, to work with local partners to be able to sustain this, or is this a one time thing? Because it's not necessarily something um, unless you put in the infrastructure that people can maintain on their own. Uh, and I would love to see this uh, this you know, as I said result in maybe an ongoing group. Uh, I see groups like this perform at the Indiana State Fair at the dance stage uh, uh, all the time. That'd be, that'd be a potential thing to kind of work towards uh, and kind of give them a sense of feeling part of something uh, uh, something bigger. I could add just one more comment. There was a, what you said reminded me, John, there's a, a note in this proposal about participants being able to work in their apartments uh, and dance and I just want to say that I have some amount of, again, I'm back to the safety concerns, but um, generally speaking, resident apartments and living spaces in this type of community are very small and very full of personal belongings. And I am doubtful that they would be an adequate amount of space for dancing uh, and so safely. So I would just, I would look to see if there's some other, um, some other opportunity even for use of this the group space the facility has available uh, even at the end of the proposal uh, there's space available or time is available um, for them to use that space would be helpful perhaps and maybe even encourage a, a buddy system type of thing so that people don't uh, have a problem by themselves and and be you know might when they might need some help mm -hmm. i'd offer though that what if dance doesn't have to engage the whole body? What if it's specific body parts, um, whatever is comfortable to you, whatever you're able. I can dance with my arms only. Mm -hmm. I probably can dance with my head only. <laughs> you know, that kind of challenge, um, something to explore with this audience for sure. Right. And I very much appreciated in this proposal that it was clear that there would be a seated option, which that was a, mm -hmm. that was a big thumbs up for me at the very beginning is that the immediate accommodation for we can dance in our seats because that is mm -hmm. absolutely true and helpful. All right, please finalize comments and give me a thumbs up when you're ready. Okay, our next applicant is Paula Scott France, and Rachel is our first reader. I don't do this very often, but in the, uh, I use excellent in all capital, capital letters, so I have to say that. Uh, <laughs> I was thrilled by this um, program, this project. This project. Um, so I have a lot of experience working with, with uh, aging adults with both wet and needle felting, and I agree absolutely with this proposal that uh, more time is going to be required. So it's not clear to me from the proposal how large a piece they're planning on for each person. Um, but I love that they are already tuned in in this proposal to saying, hey, so this is going to take longer for some people depending on the complexity. And that's wonderful uh, awareness of the process. Um, and so that's one question. Uh, so is there additional time for people to work in this facility? That part wasn't really clear to me. What is the plan if they're not able to complete in the time? Uh, what is the plan to make it up if somebody's got a miss for a medical, physical, emotional concern, whatever that is? Um, it is not clear to me in this proposal if it is for only older adults or if anyone who utilizes the cancer center is, a, is able to, to participate. So I'm not sure that it's a full fit with the, the target age objective of this fellowship, but I'd like to see more um, partnership with the program host in terms of exhibit of the finished artwork. Um, I didn't feel like there was a strong display or exhibit component to this. Um, I think this proposal could be made stronger uh, by dealing, again, I feel like I say this a lot, but the physical adaptations and safety of the participants, uh, but 
uh, lap desks um, are important in this type of project for wheelchair bound participants. Review safety concerns. The reality is if you stick yourself with one of those needles, they are barbed and they bleed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, are you gonna review that? Fingerprints are likely. Um, and if they have any kind of neuropathy, can't feel their fingers completely, if there's an added risk of that. What kind of hand protection is being provided? Just finger cots, you're gonna go with the full glove. Um, and I'm not clear from the, the budget and the proposal of this is if the material purchases really include an adequate amount of money for needles uh, to be broken. So folks with limited mobi mobility, uh, they don't always go clean in and out of that felt and that foam. Uh, with the needle. And so I found needle breaks to be much, much more likely with this particular group of artists. So just some things to consider from a technical standpoint and a safety standpoint. I really enjoyed the target. I really enjoyed the process. I love the lesson plan. I mean, I have nothing but good things to say, but just a few little kind of tweaks um, and questions with it. I had a um... The opposite reaction, Rachel, because um, I, <laughs> well, felting, okay. I've only had a few experiences with felting, but it somehow requires fine motor skills. And I was just like, how is that possible if you have mobility issues? But I'm glad that you've had experience in that and I've seen it work because that was my biggest reaction to this, that um, it's such a, 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 a very um, minute detail, you know, to be, to be moving in and out. But I do like the sensory feeling of it that they're able to like mold and, and fold and, and, and use this if they are able, that's the thing. Can you do felting this way too? I wonder, I mean, how, yeah. do you, how does that? <laughs> yeah, so you can do wet felting, you can do even inside, I've done it inside of gallon Ziploc bags to reduce friction on hands and water damage. Okay. The thing about felting is that you can purchase and I'm, I got this from their instruction list. You can purchase handles for those needles uh, mm. And so they're a knobbed handle. And so if the non-dominant hand is protected well and the knobbed handle is can use, it's really satisfying actually to keep punching into that. So mm -hmm. I love that you mentioned the tactile component. That's what I loved about it was, but it absolutely can be adjusted. In fact, the hardest part of this whole thing, if I give is the, sorry, I get excited about felting. Um, but if I had one- <laughs> I actually get excited about a lot of this. Sorry about that. But um, the 3D object that they want to felt is actually the hardest thing because that sucker likes to move around and, and requires more controlling. So there, I think they'll have the most difficulty with that 3D object, depending on how they're instructing it. But it can be done. Um, and, and it can be done. And it can be done beautifully. It's a hugely popular class in the studio's uh, full house every time we have it. So I, I'm, I, that was why I was excited because I think it's unlikely. People think it's too hard, but it can be adapted well. That's great. I just want to add one more thing. One strength, I think, is that um, the artist has a lot of support. There is a therapist in-house that, that she can lean on um, for more information about the participants. And there's also intentionality in providing technical support um, with by an intern and whatnot, and if they have to go and Zoom, that's available too. I think that's setting up everybody for success. Um, there again, I'm going back to my six sessions. It's six sessions and, well, visual artists, uh, just like musicians, I highly encourage adding a cartridge fee because there are materials to be moved around and to gather and to set up and, and wipe out. So just, um, this is overall, not just this particular artist, but maybe look into the number of sessions so that there is more um, allocation for artist fee. And I strongly recommend using that art therapist um, to, to really get personal with the participants and then what they're able to do and some adaptations um, needed. I actually wanted to hear more about the art therapist. Uh, it just kind of like, it just kind of seemed to get dropped in there. And it's like, you know, because you're talking about doing stories that potentially could have certain triggers uh, associated with them that could make this a, a difficult session. So I, I, I wish uh, I wish there had been a little, that part had been a little bit clearer. Um, as someone who wrote a book about life story art, um, I don't think enough time has been uh, enough clear clarity around 
the idea of de helping people develop their stories, think about telling their stories, conceptualizing their stories, translating stories into visual elements, uh, thinking about narrating the pieces uh, that they're doing. Um, to me, that that's a whole that's a whole component uh, that that is underdeveloped uh, in this application, and I think it could actually be the most rewarding aspect uh, of this uh, of this activity. If, if we're really making stories that tell our life and we're talking about leaving a legacy through these items that we're, perhaps we're making, uh, there's this idea that those stories are going to be important in helping people think through that. So I, I, wish, uh, I wish they would have a little bit more uh, emphasis on the story part, not just assume, oh, everybody's got a story. People have abstract thoughts, and it really there's a whole process of turning those those experiences into actually tellable narratives uh, and narratives that then can be shown displayed. I really agree with that, John, and I I will say because I also I worked a facility where I'm the art instructor, but we also have an art therapist on staff. And there's art is therapy and art as therapy. And it's a very important distinction, that one little vowel. And so I, I think that's a wonderful opportunity for enrichment in this as well as some understanding of how those two things can be joined together because it's very powerful, uh, very powerful when it happens. Okay, thanks everyone. Please finalize comments, give me a thumbs up, and we will move to the next applicant. Is everybody ready? John, are you ready? Okay. Um, then we will move on to Jennifer N. Weinert. And John is our first reader. Uh, this is um, uh, actually looks like it's going to be an ongoing relationship uh, that this artist is, uh, has forged uh, with the uh, Moontream Studios. Um, and it's going to be this first iteration is going to be around large multimedia collage, um, which will be displayed at a culminating event. Um, and I, I really like the idea of the fact that this artist is uh, really trying to train people in in kind of the view and the approach of being an artist of like thinking about a concept and kind of leading them all the way through. And so it's not just about teaching technique, but it's about the, 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 the inner work as much as the outer work uh, seem to come through. So these are going to be 90 minute sessions, six sessions meeting uh, weekly. Um, uh, seems like the partner uh, seems like a really great organization. It's a community living um, uh, for older adults, and they're also partnering with the Council on Aging. Um, uh, but I'd still like to know a little bit more about that community. It just kind of throws that out there, and I'd like to have a little bit um, um, more development there. Overall, I thought this seemed like, uh, from an art point of view, uh, seemed to be really uh, uh, well developed for me. What were y'all's thoughts? I um, like that they um, presented the end goal during the first session. It's always good to see what the finish line is. And I think they did a good job of presenting that there. Um, there again, I just want to mention similar to others, collage requires materials to, to organize and, and, and bring. So Preparation for that is crucial, obviously. And I'm going to go back. How many sessions did we say this one is? Six. Six sessions. Um, just be 
be thinking about the time needed for preparation because obviously you have to curate the materials brought in. Um, if perhaps tear off pages from the magazine beforehand since uh, participants may not be able to do that themselves. And that's a lot of preparation time. So just be considerate of your own time. Artist fee um, appropriately applies to preparation too. And um, what my, my biggest recommendation though is towards the lesson planning. So at the end here, um, I've, there, we have a program at Arts for Learning that uses collage in the lessons. And the problem with the participants is that they tend to put everything on that sheet of paper that, that is representative of who they are or what the story is about or wherever the concept is about. But the essence perhaps is to determine what is important in that collage. And I would encourage the artist to appropriate time for that editing process, just as for representation. So you cut images to represent your message, but you should also equally spend enough time editing what is unnecessary so that you have a coherent message. So this is very pointed only because I've experienced this and the frustration is that you end up with a bunch of things on one page. Um, yeah, so that's my biggest comment on this one. Can, can, uh, one point I, I failed to make that I'd written in my notes. Um, I noticed that there was a $400 um, is coming in as a participant fee uh, and I, not knowing how many participants there are, it makes me wonder what that fee is. And it seems like here's a chance you're getting actually a major subsidy from the state to do this workshop. It seems like if it, if you've got a participant fee, um, I understand the reason for that, but it seems like you're getting a major subsidy here uh, that I'd really, I hope that it is not too exorbitant uh, for too too high of a bar for people but I can't really know that without knowing the number of participants I mean this is a hundred dollar uh, participant fee a ten dollar five dollar I don't know I noted that as well John and asked that same question and I love that I hadn't thought of that issue of editing voice so thank you for that but um, I agree I, I have concern about the fee um, Part of it and I would encourage either dropping the number of classes or seeking out another donation to to kind of resolve that um, if it's anything beyond a nominal uh, investment you know nominal um, fee um, I think the provision of materials plus the encouragement to self-provide from the participants own resources is excellent if they have a a birthday card they've received or something else in their home um, that feels personal to them. I like that they have the opportunity to bring that item in and include it. I think the accommodation for transportation support is wonderful. Uh, and I'm thrilled to see that, especially given the rural nature of this community. Depending upon the location and the number of individuals potentially traveling via bus plus a 90 minute class, for some uh, participants, this may um, constitute a significant expenditure of energy. And you may want to consider some adding some simple snack or sustenance type of component to the program that's not listed. But for some individuals, this could be three to four hours, depending on what their transport and their readiness time and all that amounts to. And that uh, if people leave and they get home and they're exhausted from the experience, that really can impact uh, kind of how they feel about participating and their desire to keep it going. Um, the other thing I um, would suggest, uh, because sometimes this happens with collage, much like the edit feature, but people can look at their work and particularly in process, because a lot of times collage doesn't come in together until the end. So in the process, it can look like like a two-year-old did it, you know, you can have that sense about it. Uh, and so if you don't fully have an artist's vision for collage, it's hard until you get to the end to see it. So I would consider adding a brief reflection question or activity and or a feedback form to each session. So those who are disposed to be really critical of their work, um, kind of have a formalized process or opportunity to receive positive feedback on how they're doing as they go along and kind of develop those self-affirmation skills. 
collage is an excellent opportunity to help develop those self-affirmation skills, but it, it kind of has to be delivered in parcels. Um, some participants cup is always going to be half empty and some is always going to be half full. It doesn't matter how old we are. We're all that way. And so being aware of that and alert to that and proactive in addressing that, I think is critical to this type of art project. I want to add one more thing regarding the culminating event that um, they probably thought of this. I just couldn't find it. Maybe it's in another proposal that will consider a gallery walk so that it's representative of an actual gallery exhibit that um, the artist's work is displayed and then they move around and look at each other's work. But what's crucial about a gallery walk is that you also have, it's not the right questions because there are no wrong questions, but just the appropriate questions to ask the artists themselves uh, that is pertaining to not just what, what the viewer liked about the work, but perhaps prod further about why did you choose red and why did you put this here and stuff like that. And that can be incorporated in the discussion leading up to the culminating event. Um, so, and, and this comment pertains to other visual artists that are doing some kind of a display of artwork at the end too. <clears throat> okay, thank you everyone. Please finalize comments and give me a thumbs up when you are ready. Okay, our final applicant is Roberta Wong. And Ploy, you are our reader. So this is the ballet class. Um, we're ending with grace. I like this. <laughs> and um, that was my uh, reaction, initial reaction. What a gift this is to um, uh, the participants to have someone leave them in such a graceful experience, no pun intended. <laughs> but um, one strength though is starting the program early in the year, I think gives them a lot of buffer before the end date of the lifelong uh, fellowship or this, this grant. And I'm pretty sure that has something to do with availability too, but I think this is the only one that's starting quite early. And then most of them are either in mid um, March and, and so forth. So I think that's strength because, you know, next year is just as vulnerable to the world <laughs> as it is this year. So we never know what cancellations and unexpected changes um, to come. So um, there again, adaptations for mobility. Um, ballet is very specific. Um, it has a uh, specific movement and whatnot. And I'm pretty sure they thought of this, but what would uh, develop, a, if I'm saying that correctly, look like if you're sitting down and you know, and, and other moves as well. So that's probably already outlined or thought through there, um, but I just wanna put that um, in the forefront. And um, wouldn't it be nice for the instructor to wear the outfit so that the participants can have an up close experience of that if they haven't already. But this is an opportunity to really make it close and personal to them, but that would be, um, I think, an, a good addition to the experience. My only comment here is in the budget. It seems that the in-kind cost for the costume is rather high. And I wonder if, uh, I, I'm sure they are factoring the actual cost, but consider depreciation. I'm not sure. I'm stuck kind of like all over the place with the in-kind, how it's described and how the artists are filling it in. But that's valued at $5,000 and she did factor that. It just threw me off that the total cost of the program is 6,000 and in-kind is a good amount of money. That's probably insignificant because it's in kind and they know that they're only working with a thousand dollars there but just some clarity perhaps as we um, move forward with in kind contribution um, in the future um i think that's that's all i have really um yeah that's all i have to say i'm with you on this i love this proposal i uh, thought it was outstanding um I have just a couple of comments. Uh, one, if you have not already, consider strongly this time of day when scheduling. Uh, so programming typically between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. that does not conflict with other popular activities or lunch, it's probably your ideal window with this community. You're talking about assisted living and health center 
uh, residents for it. And they do have a, a shorter window typically in a day in which they would wanna engage in this type of activity. Um, also, uh, really something to think about going in is what your affirming response will be to those who need to miss a session. Uh, so long-term care employees are restricted um, and how many times and in what ways they can invite a resident living in a licensed area, so assisted living and health center, to participate in any program. Uh, so in the, and the law is written such to prevent residents from kind of being badgered or coerced into doing something they don't want to do. Sometimes the greatest gift we can give people is the ability to refuse us and then still love them. So uh, I think that that's just something to be aware of. In my experience, teaching artists can do a couple of things to increase their likelihood for success. Uh, one, of, one thing they can do is create a printed uh, reminder invitation that uh, their activities personnel can go and deliver to the person the morning of the event, reminding them, hey, we've got ballet today. I'm really looking forward to seeing you. We're gonna work on this, or this is what we're seeing today. So that type of invitation in advance gives an older adult living in a, in a licensed care area the ability to really process it, to plan for it, to look forward to it, to be reminded of it. And those things can be really helpful to having them actually uh, arrive to the program. And then alternatively, how then do you let that um, aging artist, or in this case, ballet dancer, um, how do you uh, make sure that they feel invited and included if they don't come, that that's just not the end of the road. If they refuse one week and they come back the next week. Um, and so that's kind of the sense of a belonging. And I think that teaching artists, uh, and we have a lot of success um, giving the resident uh, a graceful letter is handwritten. This is what we did today. We really miss seeing you. We hope you can come next time. That type of positive communication it can be really freeing to a participant to say no, but know that they're still wanted and appreciated the next time. Um, we, all, we all could use a little grace and it's a small detail that will help a lot sometimes. Um, the other thing I want to call out is I love the safe space approach to protecting resident dignity in the culminating event. I love that sense because it's easier to take a risk uh, when you when you know it's safe to do so and you feel supported in that. So I love that component. Um, I would say that given that safe space approach, you may want to help uh, add something tangible that could be shared with their family outside of that culminating event. So um, and would also help trigger a memory for that participant uh, and because Certainly uh, individuals living in assisted living and health center environment are gonna have varying degrees of uh, cognitive intactness. And so the ability to have something tangible in hand, maybe it is a class picture or an individual portrait of participant with their instructor in the room they did it in, um, or uh, maybe uh, with one of the visiting uh, dancers in their costume, you know, that type of thing. It, it sounds a little touristy, um, but those types of memories can be great and can be great connection to their family member who's coming in to visit them. And with long-term care facilities, having sometimes limited visitation opportunities for families because of uh, COVID and influenza and any other things, you know, that is a takeaway. Hey, this is sitting on mom's dresser, this beautiful picture of mom with this ballerina and this fantastic costume. What, what was this mom? Let's talk about it. So I would like to see, it's kind of a non-traditional culminating event, but I think it, it can go beyond that safe space dance to something else uh, that would further enrich that and spark joy and memory uh, for a participant. Um, I think Paul and Rachel have said just about everything. I, I think this is a really great application. I think really like some of Rachel's ideas about um, about creating that, that kind of ongoing uh, piece that might remain. Uh, I really like the fact that uh, people are going to be encouraged to share their own dance experiences, their own interactions. With that, uh, I would uh, remind that this is Indiana, uh, where dance sometimes is like like some people grew up with it being the taboo and trying to, to negotiate that's going to be perhaps uh, part of the conversation uh, 
uh, to have. But I, I, I felt like the social engagement on this seemed really uh, well thought out and well developed. I think one of the things is uh, I could see this be an ongoing uh, activity, not just a one-time residency. Uh, it just seems like uh, uh, something that people could get interested in, and they just, if they just knew every Thursday was ballet or whatever, it could be a really strong ongoing uh, activity if you could find support for it. I have one last comment that um, I applaud the artist for um, seeking support and expertise from other organizations like Audiences Unlimited, Lifetime Arts, and also having a personal connection with her father. I think it's just, this will be equally a wonderful experience for her as it is for the participants. Yes. I agree. I, I, am, I was thrilled uh, in reading this proposal because it was clearly written with um, heart and lived experience. And that, that's what makes art come together, I think, in beautiful ways. So I was thrilled with it. I'm so, I really want to, do we get follow-ups on these? Do we get to know how they, <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> Actually, I may qualify already for some of them. So can I attend? <laughs> 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 okay thank you everyone finalized comments give me a thumbs up when you're finished and we'll wrap things up Okay, this concludes the panel discussion for the 2021 Lifelong Arts Indiana Fellowship. Thank you.